in my last video, I mentioned that as part two of this particular series on marketing art, I would talk about galleries. So let's talk about galleries. My perspective actually comes as a person that owned a gallery, what they call a gallerist. I ran a gallery for 26 years, I think it was, between Florida and North Carolina. And <clears throat> had a very nice and successful operation. And I learned an awful lot of things around galleries. And when I started out in a gallery, I remember actually my first brick and mortar gallery in 1973 in Tallahassee, Florida. Now, it was a wonderful idea. I loved being, having all the art and I had a, you know, rapport with the people that I did meet. The only problem was it was on a one-way one street in Tallahassee where there wasn't a lot of street traffic and much less people that would be coming home or going to and for about their business, that they would stop and walk into the gallery. It was just not the ideal situation. And it was very difficult. But I learned a lot about the gallery operation. I learned a lot about dealing with people. And I learned a lot about promotion, integrity, how to establish a business that will actually operate and how to kind of do things when I was feeling myself out. Now, when I started actually doing business, I got a little bit too big for my britches, and I rented a huge space also in Tallahassee. There was a commercial um, industrial, commercial industrial area, and I had a single room gallery that was about 1,800 square feet with 12-foot ceilings, and I had suspended uh, smoke lucite panels that were suspended way up in the ceiling that came down, and that's where I hung the art on. And along two walls, I had easels. There was a continuing easel that I could set up uh, works of art that were unframed, and I could sit upon these easels. And it was really a wonderful operation. And then, unfortunately, 1973 happened. And for those of you that don't understand what that means, 1973 was a, one of the few really great recessions that this country has seen in the last 100 years. And when the Great Recession came, didn't matter how beautiful it was, didn't matter how elegant things were hung, it didn't matter how nice the art was, it didn't matter if it was affordable or not, people simply stopped buying art. Of course, it affected me because I was essentially brand new in the art business, maybe a year and a half old in the art business, maybe two years, and I just couldn't make it. But a friend of mine who was a stockbroker, he came in to visit one day and he brought two friends of his from Tampa. And these two friends were, um, it just so happened, and I say that I don't believe in coincidences, but it just so happened that one was a property manager for AT&T and they had just closed down a space in the lobby of the first financial tower in Tampa, Florida. And he told me what it was. And I didn't even have to see a photograph. I didn't have to hear any more from him. I didn't have to do any of that. I said, I'll take it. Because he offered it to me at a very, very inexpensive price. And it was like a no brainer. And from that day forward, Two and a half days later, I was on the road. I closed up my gallery in Tallahassee. I put my house up for sale. I loaded everything, including my home, all my goods, and my all the props and inventory that I had in my gallery, all the furniture, everything, including the lucite panels. And it was all in the truck heading to Tampa. 
the next morning, about five o'clock in the morning, I rolled into Tampa, Florida. The sun was just was summertime, and the sun, the uh, uh, sun was just beginning to rise. And I went directly to the gallery because I got loaded up all my gallery stuff first. So it would be the first to come out when we received there. And I unloaded all the inventory, the furniture, the lucite panels, everything I had into the space in the lobby of the first financial tower, which at the time was the tallest building in all of Florida. And I put all my inventory in my space, which is a tiny little space. You can't see it, but I'm here in my dining room that's maybe 15 feet this way and maybe 25 feet this way. And my gallery was not a whole lot bigger than that. It's just a tiny little space. I think it was 21 way and... 40 or 45, 50 feet the other way. So it was a tiny little space, especially for a retail operation. But the location was spectacular. And I mean, this lobby had uh, traffic, foot traffic, all day long going in and out of the first financial tower. And then the first one housed uh, lawyers, it housed all kinds of professional people, accountants. Of course, there was the bank that was the first financial bank was uh, occupying the other side of the lobby that I had. And on this side of the, of, uh, of me, also adjacent to the lobby was Merrill Lynch stockbrokers. So I can't tell you how tickle pink I was. Because all of the gallery, excuse me, all of the traffic that was going by my gallery all day long were professional people, people that had disposable income, people that understood investments, people that understood business, and people that could speak, I could talk to intelligently about works of art that I was handling. And virtually instantly, the quality of the goods skyrocketed that I had in the gallery. And when I got in the gallery business, I was handling a lot of fine prints, you know, with original lithographs and etchings and silk screens and all this sort of thing and original paintings. And uh, when people would come in, I had maybe a half a dozen original works of art hanging, and these smoke glass panels I brought from Tallahassee, they were hanging in the window so that people could see into the gallery, and they would see the first work of art they could see was hanging on the smoke glass, smoke glass panels that were hung about, oh, 18 inches in front of the window. So the traffic going by there all the time, people would stop by and they could see original works of art hanging on these smoke glass panels just inside. But the fact that they were translucent panels, you could see beyond it, they could see and in the front part of my gallery that there was all kinds of works of art. And in that place, I had so much inventory in such a small space. I had paintings and prints and I had a cabinet set up, a print cabinet was full of stuff and stuff leaning up against the walls and it's just stuff everywhere. And they could see that when even when I was closed, they could see what was hanging with a nice light on it. There was spotlighting the work of art that was being featured for the day. But they could also see all this other stuff, even though it was sort of in shadows. You could see all this other stuff hanging around. And then I had the gallery. The space was cut one-third for the gallery and then, I mean, two-thirds for the gallery and one-third for my own private office. A private office was something very special, too, because in my private office, 
which was divided from the other gallery by these translucent panels, I had a nice two-seat sofa in one place, and I had two comfortable chairs that was next to the sofa, facing each other, and I had a nice stained glass Tiffany style lamp. It wasn't Tiffany, but a really, really nice lamp. And I had more works of art hanging around there. And then I had my desk and phone. And back in those, we didn't have computers and cell phones and stuff. I just had a regular telephone with a cord. And you know, you talk like this hello, can I help you? And on the floor, I had a nice oriental rug. In other words, the, the place was just very, very elegant and very nice. And it didn't cost me hardly anything to put it together. Because with the closing of my business in Tallahassee, I didn't have any money. But I took what I had and I purposed myself to make a very elegant operation out of that. And people would come in and out and they'd look around and stuff, you know, and um, and then they would wander into my office, and of course, if people came in, I would get up and I'd say, you know, can I help you? And they either did or they didn't, you know. But if somebody looked like they were interested in uh, a work of art or something, I would take that off the wall, and I would sit it on the easel that I had right next to me when I had a, a, a spotlight already arranged to fall on that work of art on the easel. And I would invite him to sit down, and I had a pot of coffee going all the time. And it was a hallmark of every opera from, from that time forward. It was a hallmark of every operation I ever ran. So I always had a fresh cup of coffee brewing. And as people would come in, I'd say, how would you like to have a cup of coffee? And they go, well, sure, you know, especially around in the middle of the day when people were have, after lunch and stuff, you know, they'd be a little bit kind of slowing down after eating a big lunch or whatever they did. So I would offer them a cup of coffee. Usually they accepted. And we sat down and I said, tell me about yourself. And I never tried to sell a work of art. Never tried to talk them into anything. We sat down and I said, tell me about you. Tell me about what do you do? And they would tell me, I'm an accountant. I'm a, um, you know, a lawyer. I work up here on the 35th floor and I, you know, do one thing or another, professional engineer or whatever. And people would come in that were looking at their stock portfolio next door to me at Merrill Lynch. And they would wander in after they had done whatever business they had to do with Merrill Lynch. They would come into my place, and just, you know, extra time to kill, whatever. And they'd just wander in. And we'd sit down and we'd have a cup of coffee and I'd talk about what he'd do. And he said, well, I was just in to see Merrill Lynch and check on a couple of things and do some business there. And I said, mm, that's interesting. You know, tell me about it. So they would about what they were doing with Merrill Lynch. Anyway, that was my introduction to Tampa, Florida, and we had a fabulous operation there, and I loved it. But then another opportunity arose. Now, if you are familiar with Tampa at all, you'll be familiar with Old Hyde Park in Tampa. And at the time, there was a kind of a, it was at the time, it was a fringe area in Old Hyde Park that a house came up for sale that was in a fringe neighborhood, meaning that it was kind of a transition in from residential. It was obvious it was going to be commercial sooner or later. And an opportunity that came by, another one of those opportunities that was just too good to pass by. So there was an old Victorian house available for sale in Old Hyde Park in Tampa, Florida. And it was because of, at the time the area was sort of a fringe area. I mean, 
it was for sale very inexpensively, relatively speaking. And I had, I just jumped at the chance. And so we thought and prayed an awful lot about whether to keep the gallery downtown and run the operation in Old Hyde Park. But I finally said, no, I said, let's just have one operation. I didn't want to start splitting myself up. So uh, we closed the gallery downtown in the first financial tower and moved into our home that we lived upstairs on the second floor of this old Victorian house. And the downstairs was my place of business. And I had a gallery that was four times the size of the one that I had in downtown. And I had a, uh, a nice uh, environment, had wall-to-wall -wall carpeting throughout, which I supplemented also with oriental rugs. And I had a library that was second to none anywhere in the United States in the art business. I had an art library that was probably the best library on that, on the subject of American and European artworks than any place in America. And I really mean that. And I studied art all the time. People, by the time we moved, we were in the downtown for about two and a half or three years. And by the time I was finished there, I had already had a reputation in the United States. And when I moved out, I was allowed to put up a notice giving my new address. And that notice stayed up for, oh golly, about two and a half or three months so that the chances were a lot of people that I did business with, if they didn't know, I sent out notices that we had moved, but if they didn't get the notice when they came downtown, they had a notice that we had moved to our address in Old Hyde Park and uh, had a little directions, a little map drawn on how to get there. And boom, it was really easy right across the bridge from downtown. It wasn't very far at all. So anyway, uh, and we operated the gallery in Old Hyde Park for years and years and years. And very, very successful. But one of the reasons why I was successful is that even though I didn't have a lot to work with, when, when I first got in the gallery business, I had a credit card with a limit of $2,500 on it, and this was in 1972. 72, late in 72, early in 73. And that was all that I had. And I was opening a business with a single credit card that had $2,500 available and an idea to open up a place. So anyway, the, the operations that I ran, all of them, even the ones that failed, were very elegant. They, if you're going to sell artworks, and especially you're going to sell ones that were, the ones that said, they were real expensive, but everything was original, and everything was moderately priced. I mean, you know, I sold in those days, Picasso, Prince, and Miro, and Chagall, and Salvador Dali, and, and some originals about some local artists that I handled. But one thing I learned is that you don't make any money on consignment. And consignment is a lousy way to do business, both for the gallery and for the artist. Because if, if, I took a work on consignment and I priced it at, say, $500. Well, if I owned it and let's say I had it for two months and I couldn't sell it, then if I owned it, I could set whatever price I wanted to on it and I could sell it without having to worry about checking with an artist or 
whether I was going to cut my commission in half, which is usually, I took 40% commission in those days. But like I said in my last video, these days, it's even hard to find 40%. Galleries easy to take, take 50%. And I have checked in some galleries in New York. And they're taking 50 and 60 and sometimes 70% commissions. Boy, that's a heck of a bite out of her gallery. And at the price level that I was dealing with when I was early on in the gallery business, a third just just wasn't enough. If you sell work for $200, I'm, you know, bravo, and I was excited to do it. But I have $200, you know, I was making $66 commission. You know, and if, if, if I wasn't making a whole lot of sales, it just wasn't enough money in there to survive. I had enough money to pay the rent and to eat and, you know, run a gallery and a household. So I began to change my philosophy and I began to buy works of art. And if even if an artist came in and they wanted me to look at their artwork, if I, if I like their artwork, I would pick out two or three works of art, whatever they had, whatever I could afford, and I wrote a check for it. I never, I stopped taking things on consignment. This is probably 19, 74, maybe, 75, somewhere in there. I just stopped consigning. So any time that I actually bought something, that I wrote a check for it, and I owned it. And I've known a lot of some good, successful gallery people that did the same thing. That when they found a work of art that they liked, that they wrote a check for it. Now, there is also, I also was beginning back in the late 70s, I would say, I also began to do my own studio work in the nighttime when I would close my gallery. And I began to work on my own work and develop my own painting as an artist. And I took the same tact that I was doing as a gallery that when I went around to different galleries and different business people and I wanted to make a living by showing my gallery, excuse me, showing my artwork in another gallery, they said, okay, they started to write out a receipt for um, consignment. I said, no, no, you don't understand. I don't consign work. And boy, Gallery people went nuts over that. What do you mean you don't get signed? I said, do you like my work? Yeah, very much. I said, do you know, think you could sell it? Well, yeah, I think I'd sell it. Then if you want it and you think you can sell it, you have to write a check if you want to own it and if you want to show it. Well, that just kind of blew them away. But slowly but surely, I began to develop a network of art of art galleries that would actually write a check for my work. And when they did, they did the same thing for all of them. If you like my work, if you think it's saleable, you, you really believe in what we're doing here, you want to work together, then all you have to do is write a check. And you can sell the tar out of my work for any price you want to. And I always gave them a very fair price. Of which I estimated, I by this time I was starting to sell work at public auction in New York, and I would show them what my artwork was selling for, and I said, "Now this is what typically my work has been selling for out of galleries, and do you think you can sell it for this amount of money?" And they said, "Yeah." So I said, "I will take one third the price if you write the check." If you want a consignment, you know, well, in the first place, I'm not going to consign it. But if you did want a consignment, then you know that if you got it from an artist and it's going to consign it, I wouldn't take any less than about 
60% myself if you're going to try to consign it. But that's not an invitation for you to consign it because I am not in the consignment business. I'm in the cash business. Well, sometimes it offended a gallery owner. But if they hesitated and they looked at me like, you know, are you for real kind of thing? I often had to teach gallery owners how to make money in the art business simply by writing the check. And we began an association in Central Florida back in the mid to late 1970s that we had a whole network. Back in those days, there was no internet, there was no computers, there was none of that stuff was going. Everything was face to face, handshake to handshake, you know, look each other in the eye, do business, take care of each other. We had an association of gallery people, and all of us took care of each other. We had a um, an association, Southeast Professional Art Dealers Association. And we established parameters for doing business, a code of ethics to do business. We certified uh, members to uh, that were interested in doing appraisal work and this sort of thing. To we certified that and taught them how to do appraisal work and what kind of integrity it took to do appraisals. And it just went on and on like that. But we had a solid, very solid uh, association, and. On more than one occasion, uh, a member of the association had a work of art stolen from their gallery. I don't thank God I never had. Well, a man tried to steal a work of art from me one time, but we discovered that before he even could get out the door, and that didn't work. But some of the some of the other gallery owners, they uh, ran. Uh, they had to come to us and say, you know, I ran into this problem and I had this work stolen. Well, I had connections at that time with the Tampa Police Department and with the FBI. And depending on the level we were doing it, we had ended up with a, a fabulous track record on recovering stolen works of art. We had a great track record on discovering uh, people that were faking art and were trying to or were trying to sell fake works of art and we we sucked the police on we got the FBI involved and we were successful in prosecuting people that were uh, that had what you might call ulterior motives when they walked into a place of business. And we brought them to trial. We got them convicted. And we put them in jail. When I say we, it was the legal system that did all the real legal work. But what we did is we just simply watched out for each other. And through our establishment of this association, we took care of each other. We cleaned up nefarious critters that were trying to steal and put people in harm's way. And we had a very successful operation. So this all speaks to the art gallery business. This all speaks to how to judge a gallery by how how does a gallery do its business? Does the gallery, when you walk in, not as an artist, but as a customer, does the gallery have a vibe to it that makes you comfortable and that makes you actually want to spend your money with that gallery? And 
if the answer is, well, yeah, you know, I mean, like I said, when people come into my place, even when we moved into the house and in Old Hyde Park, Tampa, first thing I did when people walked in, they'd come in, they just, you know, they'd, I'd say, what drew you in? All I really had for an advertisement, well, I had a sign out front, it was a nice sign. I painted it myself, put it up in the front of the, in the front, my front yard, my front lawn, up next to the curb. And people saw the sign, they would stop, or people that by word of mouth, they would come by. But there were a lot of businessmen. Like I said, it was a fringe area when we first moved in. And by the time we moved out of Tampa, it was a going commercial area, Old Hyde Park. But when people came in, what they found was acceptance. Hello, how are you today? Would you like a cup of coffee? And the coffee, I had a big old urn about two quarts, I think it was, about this big around, about this tall, a little spigot on it. And, um, whenever we drank the last of that, you know, which was usually fairly quick, I made another batch of coffee. Always had coffee going. Sometimes I even had some cookies or a donut or something. But when people came in, every time they came in, not special customers, everybody that came in, first question, would you like a cup of coffee? And I made them feel comfortable. In the living room of our, of our, home slash gallery in Old High Park, had a nice bow front uh, the living room, was had a bowed curved interior on it. And I had the same couch I had in my tiny little operation downtown the first financial tower. That was also in my living room with my two chairs that I had. And then I had, it was, you know, big and I had other um, I had, you know, I had other pieces of furniture and I had, and the places I usually met people and sat down to talk was in the library. So people could see that I had this fabulous library all on American and European artworks. And libraries just have a way of, it's just to have a way of, it speaks of comfort. It, it, not only can see education, but libraries are just comfortable places. You can go to any country, excuse me, any library in the country, and you go to their library, whether it's a small town library or New York Public Library, it doesn't matter. Libraries just have a nice feel to them. And I wanted that way to be the way my gallery was. And then... I had these French doors that opened into the dining room. And I used the dining room as a place where I could, when I was selling works of art on paper, I could take these things and I could spread them out on this big old conference table. It was kind of a boat-shaped conference table that would seat on eight people. And... They we sit either sit down or walk around this big old uh, table and and I could take these works of art, even paintings and stuff, and I could spread these out on this nice big nice big old conference table, and you know people could kind of look at them, go through them, and handle them. Go they, everything was protected, so I didn't mind them handling them. And adjacent to that was my office. And in my office, I had maybe three or four what you would call relatively important works of art. And in my office, I had a Chagall, for instance, a Chagall original drawing. I would have uh, an exceptional Picasso etching. I'd have an important Miro lithograph on the wall. If I was handling at the time a particular artist, 
I would have the very finest of the work that they produced, and that would be hanging above my desk. I just made sure that everything was elegant and nice and had a warm, friendly feel to it. And people liked that. And when I offered them a cup of coffee, they said, always say, sure, I'll take a cup of coffee. And we could sit down. And I never, never said, hey, would you like to buy this artwork? You know, and like you're opening a coat on the street and say, hey, I got a Picasso here. Would you like one? You know, I never, ever did that. I would sit down with a customer and I would say, tell me about yourself. What do you do? How do you make your living? What are you interested in? And listen, I had uh, attorneys that come to my office that were customers for life. Some, here it is, that was 35, 40 years ago. I still have some of my customers from Tampa that send me a, a little note by email now uh for Christmas or New Year's or I had a lot of Jewish customers for Hanukkah or for Yom Kippur or something that uh they would send me just a little note saying, Hey, I had a happy you know, Hanukkah or Merry Christmas or whatever it was. And what I'm trying to point I'm trying to make is that I made lifelong friends and lifelong customers. And then people that I sold artwork to back then during the 1970s and 1980s, they came back to me in the 2000s. If they wanted to sell a work of art, they would look me up on the internet. Now, you know, after 1997, we closed our gallery for good. And I went online Never look back, and we're going to be talking about galleries online in my next video. But my point is that as I made lifelong friends and customers, we stayed in touch. Even if it was by back in those days, you have a letter and or a card, and you write a greeting on it. You stick it in an envelope, and you seal it up. You take a stamp lick the stamp, you put it on there, you go to the post office or wait for the mailman, you give it to the mailman and go out in the mail. That's the way we did business back in those days. Everything was by mail and by telephone. So, anyway, I, I hope I'm making my point. I don't mean to babble on a lot. Um, artists, Loved my gallery and they loved the atmosphere. They loved me how comfortable it was to come in and sit down and have a cup of coffee. And they could see that I really cared about the people that came in. Because somebody walked into my gallery, I didn't ask them, are you an attorney or are you an artist or what's the deal? When they would come into my place, they were all treated the same. And with respect and with care, and with an understanding that they just might have something interesting that I can learn from them. Or they might have something, we might have something interesting in common. And when we did that, we always got along and we were always able to sit down and talk. And it didn't always lead to sales, but it always led to lifelong friendships. Because here's something, the lesson that I learned, and it's been backed up by people that I know. People will not always remember what you say to them, but they will always remember how you made them feel. So I'm going to leave you with that note. And next time, the next video, we're going to do online business. And so I just want to close with this, and that is stay tuned and stay alert for those opportunities that will surely come your way. And if you want to like this video, like it if you like it. Subscribe if you will. But in every way, 
I want to thank you all for watching. I want to thank you for coming into my space today. If I could reach through that screen and give you a cup of coffee, I would offer you a cup of coffee. But I appreciate it. And I appreciate you for coming in. And until the next time, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you again.